Good morning and welcome to this, the third meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee of 2017. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched on to silent or flight mode? Thank you. Um, our agenda item one this morning is a decision on taking agenda items three, four and five in private. Our committee content to take agenda, agenda items three, four and five. Thank you very much. We're content. Uh, agenda item two is a substantive uh, agenda item for this morning and it's a continuation of the work that we started in November on bullying, harassment of children and young people in schools. And with us this morning we have uh, a number of people uh, from different areas in our panel and I'm delighted to have with us this morning Philip Gosney who is the Education and Youth Employment Manager at North Ayrshire Council and a member of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland who you're representing this morning. Yes. Yeah. We've got Mary Barrow of Her Majesty's Inspector of Education and Senior Education Officer for Inclusion and Equalities at Education Scotland. Good morning. Maggie Fallon, who's a Senior Education Officer for Rights, Support and Wellbeing with Education Scotland. And Barbara Cooper, the Director of the Scottish Catholic Education Service. And finally, John Edward, the Director of the Scottish Council of Independent Schools. Can I welcome you all to committee this morning and thank you for your, your continued uh, work with us in this area because we kicked this off last November. Um, but on the back of that, um, we had uh, made some uh, concerns uh, to the Scottish Government on the anti-bullying strategy, which was uh, in draft form at the time. The, the Scottish Government agreed that the committee should do some work along with all of the interested uh, parties in order to ensure that that anti-bullying strategy worked best, because some of the young people we had in front of us firmly convinced. So we thought, well, why don't we work together with, with the government and, and agencies to ensure that, that we get a better um, understanding of what young people are expecting from us uh, when, when they go to school, especially when they want to go to school in a safe uh, environment. So um, kicking off this morning, I wanted to do a, a sort of a, a general question and maybe um, I, I'm not looking for opening statements because we've not got a lot of time and we've got lots of questions, but maybe just a, a wee bit of insight into each of your organisations and, 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 and where you see you, you're, you're fitting into um, how the strategy would develop and work for young people. John, could we, could we start with you? Sure, Paul, uh, good morning. Yes, uh, I represent the 75, 76 um, independent schools, which range from mainstream schools, both day and boarding, nursery all through, single sex, co-ed, but also a substantial number of independent uh, complex additional sport needs schools, most of which are residential. So there's quite a range of uh, interest there, and there's also quite a range of uh, approaches that schools have to take in relation to issues like this, because uh, probably a third of our pupils are residential, either boarding or residential. So there is a 24-7 pastoral care there, as well as um, the, the daytime school issues. Uh, we weren't part of the, the steering group that set up the, the strategy, but we obviously follow these issues very closely. We're inspected by Education Scotland in the same way, and the care inspectorate, our schools, uh, run closely to Higios 4 and issues like this. Um, what we've done is we've developed our own child protection strategy, and that incorporates um, uh, general guidelines on bullying taken from the Respecting Rights Agenda from UNICEF, taken from... Uh, respect me and brave the rage and others who do some training courses for us and the i suppose the key thing for us is that each school has to effectively approach this in its own way because they're entirely autonomous so the governors of our school are trustees directors but they're also the employer employers of the school staff both support and teaching and therefore they're the directing authorities when it comes to legislation such as the children and young people's act so they're the ones that have to set policies. But what a lot of FAR schools have done uh, recently is seek to engage the pupils in writing policies, um, whether it's um, positive relationship policies, behaviour, health and well-being, moral education, and so on. And so you'll see a lot of our schools are rights-respecting schools, and they've used that as a way of dialogue with the pupils to treat issues that come up in bullying, and they come up in all uh, schools, and in ours are no exception, particularly as relates to protected characteristics, um, but also to try and at approach the attitudes that lead to bullying in the first place and see if they can uh, try and understand what prompts those kind of things within schools and therefore can uh, be dealt with as much by the pupils as by the, the teachers. Barbara. Um, so 
as you know, Catholic schools make um, up approximately 20% of the schools within Scotland. And um, while the majority of them are under local authority um, responsibility, and so therefore would follow the, the policies of the local authority, they have um, a particular characteristic um, in um, trying to ensure that church teaching is rooted um, in everything that they do from their academic, social, spiritual practice. And so I think we are particularly interested in this um, because we feel we first and foremost have experiences uh, being a, a, a a protected characteristic who's, who has gone through uh, an, an evolution, if you like, of being um, accepted um, within Scottish society, and we've got um, some experience to offer there. But also um, because rooted within our tradition is um, what we would call uh, an experience of reconciliation, which is now more commonly known as restorative practice and peer mentoring and trying to ensure that this, while it's rooted in education, goes beyond schools and is linked to our communities. Um, very close um, uh, partnerships with our, our local parishes and um, social groups such as our, our girl guides um, and sporting activities, etc. Um, and I, I welcome the opportunity to, to be here and to, and to offer our experience um, and to, to consider ways in which we can root it in the formal curriculum but also in the informal curriculum as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Good morning. I am an HM inspector of education. I am one of a team of dedicated inspectors undertaking inspection and scrutiny activities in early years, primary, secondaries, and as, you, as you're aware, we also do college and, and other uh, sort of scrutiny activities. A key focus of the work I do in schools is around uh, ensuring well-being and quality and inclusion. My background and my senior education officer role, which was mentioned earlier, is about inclusion and equalities. And clearly, I bring that expertise and contribute in terms of inspection teams that knowledge. I'm also, all as a part of the new model of inspection, which, as you know, started in August, safeguarding has been given an increased emphasis and is now a core component of the inspection process. It always was, but it has been enhanced. Uh, and I'm also frequently responsible for undertaking safeguarding procedures on inspections. Thank, thank you so much, Mary. Maggie. Hi, um, I'm Maggie Fallon, um, Senior Education Officer for Rights, Support and Wellbeing uh, within Education Scotland. So that translates into me being lead for children's rights, um, our relationships and behaviour policies that includes attendance and behaviour, uh, sorry, attendance and exclusions. And I'm also responsible for wellbeing in relation to GIRFIC. I'm a member of the working group that was put, putting together the, the new respect for all the new anti-bullying guidance. Um, I'm also the policy link um, for anti-bullying with Scottish Government and I work very closely with, with Respect Me. Um, one of the other key pieces of uh, guidance that I'm responsible for implementing is better relationships, better learning, better behaviour. Thank you so much, Maggie. Philip. Hello, I'm Philip Gosney. I'm a Senior Manager at Education and Youth Employment in North Eastern Council and I'm a, mem a member of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. ADIS is a, an independent professional network for leaders and managers in education and children's services. Um, it informs and influences education policy in Scotland, and it works in partnership with local and national government and other agencies. ADIS also offers a range of professional development activities and opportunities for its members. ADIS, in line with the Scottish Government, takes bullying of any kind very seriously, including homophobic, biphobic and transphobic, and is committed to promote, uh, promoting an ethos where every pupil has the right to learn in an atmosphere that is free from victimisation and fear. Children we have the right to protection from all forms of violence, physical or mental. They must be kept safe from harm. They must be given proper care by those uh, looking after them. ADIS recognises that the wellbeing and attainment can be severely undermined by bullying behaviours. And we recognise bullying can affect confidence, it can under undermine identity, lower self-esteem, uh, result in social isolation and contribute to poor mental health and affect physical health. We would welcome refresh and updated anti-bullying anti policies and we, these should be developed with and be at the heart of a whole school approach to establishing a wel welcoming and a nurturing ethos where health and well-being um, and being safe is a necessary prerequisite to effective learning, 
to achievement and to the attainment of all young people. We expect all schools to have an anti-bullying policy, which is regularly reviewed and informed by local authority and national policy. Approaches to anti-bullying should make clear that all types of bullying are unacceptable. Th th thank you so much. And it gives us a wee picture of where you fit into the, 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 the bigger picture, because there's, there's so many component parts uh, to, to this, this work and ensuring, as, as Philip said, ensuring that safe, nurturing environment that, that can be created for, for our young people, which can only be good. We've got a number of areas where we have individual members who have um, uh, interests in areas, and I, I'm, I'm going, going to just take, take them in turn in, in, that, in that way and kick off with Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thanks very much for coming to see us this morning. I should start by declaring an interest that before I came to this place, um, I sat on the ministerial panel task force on child sexual exploitation. Uh, my wife is also a Roman Catholic primary school teacher in the city of Edinburgh. Um, in my work on the task force on child sexual exploitation, it became very clear very early on that there is an intrinsic link between child sexual exploitation and bullying in schools, particularly in the new frontiers of emerging um, social media and uh, various platforms of social media. I was the youngest person on the task force and was largely unaware of many of the platforms which uh, young people are engaging on these days, and particularly with things like Snapchat, Instagram, and, um, and other platforms where you can capture images or text um, which can be incriminating and used against um, children and young people and, and, and used to coerce them into sexual acts or other uh, kinds of behaviour, um, th this became uh, one of the priorities for the group. Can I ask each of you what your organisations are doing uh, in terms of these emerging fields of technology, um, how you're working to instill an understanding of child sexual exploitation in the teaching staff um, and uh, any other frontiers you're exploring in this area? Maggie, do you want to start there? Because I think maybe being on the working group gives you that, that insight, yeah. Yep. Um, maybe if I, if I can refer to Respect Me's research, um, that I, I know you heard um, evidence from Brian Donnelly at, at the last committee meeting, um, but just to reiterate that, that Brian did say at that point that um, within the research there was no more evidence to suggest that th there was more bullying taking place online than there was offline, um, that, uh, it, that bullying, most bullying was taking place face to face. And really in, in terms of managing it and, and dealing with it, um, it didn't matter where the, the bullying was taking place. It, what, what was important was that we dealt with it in a, in a, in a consistent way. Um, I agree that um, social, uh, the social media has made things very emotive. Um, it can become very complex. Um, but a, a number of schools have, have adopted um, some, some, some very thorough ways of, of dealing with it. And a lot of it does come down to, going back to some of the things that, that, that Philip mentioned, going back to having in place a, a positive um, ethos, inclusive um, an environment where, where bullying can't really thrive. It's, it's really, really crucial that, that schools have that in place, that they work really hard to have that. And I think there's a, a huge amount of work going on in, in schools to develop that. We, we've heard again from Barbara speaking about restorative approaches, nurturing approaches, solution-oriented approaches. S schools are working hard to develop these so that children feel safe, that they have people in schools that they can identify with, they can speak to where, where, where they are concerned. Um, the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is that, again, we would be looking for schools to develop policies under the safe and responsible use of, of mobile technology, um, where uh, children are involved in the development of that policy at a local level. It's really crucial that they're involved in, and again, we've, we've heard from colleagues about that as well, so that they have ownership of how to, you know, the, the, the safe and responsible use of, of um, mobile technology at, at, at the school level. Anybody else? Yeah, I could maybe offer something um, in terms of in this particular area. Um, we would see it um, also lying within the field of relationships and moral education. So going beyond just the aspect of bullying and helping our young people to build an understanding of, um, of how all of this is connected. Um, within our primary resource, um, which is called God's Loving Plan, there are particular lessons um, right from second level, which talk about um, different forms of technology and try to help our young people to understand about the dignity of their own body, the dignity of other people's bodies, um, and a sense of modesty. Um, but more than that, um, to also have the, the sense that there are, there are 
their trusted adults who they can go to, um, and that there is a, um, there should never be an atmosphere of secrets between them and somebody who is. Um, sometimes also within their immediate family, but there should also not be a sense of guilt in going to tell somebody. So I think that it goes, um, it's, it's a holistic approach to this um, and not just rooted within bullying. Within our secondary um, resource for relationships and moral education, which is uh, called God's Loving Plan, sorry, Called to Love, which goes from S1 to S6, we're currently refreshing um, our resources to be able to bring um, in aspects of, of the platform of social media and, um, and internet technology. Could I contribute in terms of the inspection process? <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, safeguarding and child protection is, is a core, co core component of the new inspection model. Certainly in our discussion with schools, we would be asking and looking at all their policies and procedures to ensure that child exploitation and other matters have been fully included and have been given due regard in terms of all their policy and practice. If we're aware through bullying logs, etc., of any particular incident, we would also have a detailed discussion to ensure that the school had done everything possible to support the child, to address the issue, and also, and more importantly, that the school strives to develop a culture and ethos of the highest expectation, a culture of inclusiveness where everybody feels that they belong and feel safe. It's a clearly a key aspect of any inspection process and the promotion of positive behaviour. All that will flow very much from the safeguarding and other aspects of the inspection activity. And I would quote from uh, the How Good Is Our School document four, you will see that child sexual exploitation is actually mentioned um, by name on the 2.1 safeguarding and child protection quality theme. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Anybody um, else? John? From our perspective, I mean, Mary mentioned the word ethos. That's <clears throat> very important to our schools because they, they all individually have an ethos, a philosophy which have developed over decades, centuries in some cases. So that forms a very core part of how they approach any of these problems and cyberbullying and sexual exploitation is part of that. We, um, one of the main roles that SCIS performs for its schools is uh, professional learning and development and the production of guidelines on all sorts of areas based on best practice, based on uh, case law, Qualities Act, Children and Young People's Act, whatever it may be. Um, so we have a child protection bible, if you like, which is updated almost monthly which now has a very large section on cyberbullying, on all aspects of how to deal with it, on how to prevent it, how to respond to it, how to capture the evidence of it, but also how to recognise in schools that um, increasingly, and go back to the respecting rights agenda and others, that it's pupils who are seeking to call each other out on this as well. And there's an element of self-respect and collective respect in schools that, uh, is, that, that we, they seek to engender so that there's no sense that this is an acceptable um, thing to do. I mean, all our schools will have individual uh, technology or ICT policies as well, which refer to this as well as more minor issues like the prevent duty, for instance. Um, but of course, if you've got, as I mentioned before, in the case of some residential special schools, children for 52 weeks a year, or in the case of boarding schools, eight, nine weeks a year, but 24, seven, then connections to ICT and connections to the outside world, not least your family, who may be on the other side of the world, are very important. So there has to be a very careful balance between access to technology and how it's used within the school. Thank you. And if I may, my second final question uh, this morning relates to the culture, school culture, and how aspects of school ca culture can unwittingly foster environments where bullying can take hold. And I think in particular, I'm talking about uh, the use of sport and physical education. Um, certainly in, w when I was coming up through school, um, the, it was pretty normal that uh, from a very early age, that by peer review almost, people were sort of sifted into those who could play and those who couldn't, and, who, and that would then determine who was picked last for certain team games and who wasn't. That went right through to secondary school and was almost a received wisdom amongst the physical education staff that these were the elite and that these were the, the guys that you just found something to do with during the hour of PE. 
I put this to Sport Scotland at the Health and Sport Committee on Tuesday, and they were quite vehement in their denials that this was still the case. But however, I went to Cramond Primary yesterday, and they said, no, it's absolutely still the case, to the point where we actually banned football for three months because it was leading to a culture of elitism and people being excluded. And, and we wanted to encourage the kids to try other forms of physical exercise, and it was actually a very beneficial experience. Um, I'm sure that there are policies and uh, will with within you know all levels of the education system to to stop that kind of culture of um, quasi elitism um, and peer selection. Um, but can you tell me what your feeling is as to how good we are at stopping that and, and what policies we're using? Certainly, again, coming back to the inspection process and as a person who was always picked last for all games, you know, I very much um, understand the point. There has been an, a, an increasing focus on promotion of equality and diversity in our schools. And that has been you know, a, a, a big change in our schools over the last 10 years or so. Teachers are increasingly aware that in terms of potential, ability, attributes, everybody varies and everyone has to be treated in a way that they feel valued. And I think the word valued is very important in our schools now. What happens is that sometimes behaviours are imported from out with school. Uh, you know, the, the football, the rugby uh, and other sports, also martial arts, all sorts of different activities. I would also say that increasingly uh, children and young people are involved in activities beyond the classroom, which has been a very positive attribute. A lot of that is very, it's very important that staff are very aware uh, of how to promote diversity, how to ensure positive behaviours in schools. And that comes from the promoting positive behaviours, which have been a key focus in our schools. It's also very important that when people see these behaviours, that there, there's a very consistent approach with teachers, that everyone realises that it's not all right to pick and choose, that everybody has a right to be involved, to feel that their contribution is valued. As you say, schools will, when they see it becoming a, an issue, they will, you know, that was a very you know, important intervention. They were actually preventing that behaviour, and people then understand that if they display those behaviours, then they will lose something that they value, which is their football. It's about the constant reinforcement. Equality and diversity is something that has to be reinforced day in, day out. And that's what we are seeing in our schools. But clearly, there is still, as with many things, still uh, improvements that, that are required and always will be. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Keen to hear from John about yeah. the, the private sector on this. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean obviously, sport has a, a very substantial role to play in our schools because it forms part of the extracurricular aspect of our schools. I mean, if you speak to some of uh, uh, our colleges, they will expect their uh, young people to spend almost as much time outside of the classroom as they do inside. The, the school I spoke to last week, a primary school pupil was, uh, when she totted it up, did eight hours of physical education in the course of a five day week. So they will want to encourage that in every possible way and therefore avoid anything that might put people off. Um, and so sport is approached f both from the aspects of physical and mental well being, but also in terms of developing a sense of self evaluation, but also a sense of team spirit. And even if you take some of the most famous names in, in rugby schools, um, quite a lot of them will drop rugby after one term and switch to hockey, for instance, to make sure that the people who are front of the line first time round are not front of the line for the whole year. And that's the same boys and girls. Um, in terms of pupils going out of the school, um, we follow the, the getting out there guidance from 2013 about off-site visits and pupils leaving the school aware that that may create an atmosphere in which people are more uh, susceptible. But also we have to be aware of all the other aspects of when people come out of the classroom, like uh, the maintenance of religious symbols, if you're changing into uh, sports gear, or indeed gender neutral uniform policies, which are in one, some ways easier to control within a school uniform environment. But if you're talking about changing rooms, and different sports kits, there's all sorts of issues. So there's, there's a whole range of issues, but um, I think it's fair to say none of our schools would want to discourage 
the participation of everybody in, in outdoor activities, whether it's team sport, individual sport, or more, you know, just general pursuits in terms of outdoor classrooms and other things. But the important thing in that is to have a sufficiently wide range of activities that no one child feels that this is not for them. Okay, Phil. Well. Um, nurturing approaches, the sort of practice is, is more than just a classroom based uh, approach. It should pervade all of what you do in a school, including um, health and well being and um, fitness and health and sport. At times, I think we overplay the sports card. I'm, I'm heartened that health and well being is a much wider, much wider um, sphere of importance for our young people. It is about being healthy, and there are lots of ways of being healthy other than just playing elitist sport. So we need to recognise that uh, at the present time we have lots and lots of opportunities for children, uh, both to develop individually and as part of a team. But that team approach um, should be based with, um, should have a basis of, of um, inclusive practice. It should have that restorative practice when there's the tensions build between children. So that whole approach needs to be embedded, not just in our classrooms, but in our playgrounds, on our sports fields and in our communities. Thanks very much. We're going to move into some other discrete areas of, of um, uh, emerging issues that, that came from November. But one of the things that did come from the roundtable in November was about data and how data is collected and how that data is then used. And I think Willie Coffey is going to come in on that point. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning, everybody. Yes, um, I'd like to touch on the, the issue of data, data recording and so on, and just to get a handle on the extent of the, the problem that we might face. Um, when we heard from our panel in November, there seemed to be a consensus in the panel that there was a lack of data, particularly on prejudice-based bullying. And that, that was quite a clear and striking message that we received. Uh, what would you say is the position in Scotland in terms of recording incidents of, of bullying, even on a per-school basis? Are we consistently doing it? And if we are, why would such a panel think that there is a lack of data available to us? Mary, you mentioned earlier that you've, they've changed the, the, the inspection procedure slightly. Can you maybe tell us what the changes are and how they relate to, to Willie's question? Yes. Um, in terms of um, safeguarding, has always been part uh, of any inspection. And in the old model, um, what, was, what happened was as information, data and intelligence was gathered during the week, the managing inspector or the designated inspector with the required training and expertise in child protection, all inspectors are extremely well trained in safeguarding child protection. But some uh, are obviously take it forward as their own particular interest and, and specialism, as I do myself. They then met with the head teacher and have a detailed discussion about any aspect of child protection that had come up during the inspection that they wanted to discuss in greater detail. We've expanded that um, and moved to including much more emphasis on safeguarding and child protection. And that's the actual name of the quality theme. I think that's been an extremely positive um, move because there's many aspects of safeguarding that may are not you know, indicated to be child protection, but you want to have a discussion about uh, protected characteristics. It might also be, you know, young carers looked after children, etc. You may particularly want to have conversations around their safeguarding. The data is very important in any safeguarding and child protection procedures, a range of data. Attendance, for example, is a very important aspect of data because if somebody's not in the school, then clearly there are concerns about their safeguarding. So attendance exclusions also are important data. And there are others. Uh, for example, you look to see how well the young person is attaining and achieving, because that can often be an indication of difficulties or an unmet need. As part of the safeguarding procedures, bullying logs are looked at in schools. The introduction of this quality indicator ensures that there will be a continued consistent approach by inspection teams. So what you'll find, all inspection teams will be looking and asking for bullying logs. As I do myself, I have looked at many bullying logs. Bullying logs are important not so much in the numbers, but indicating what the issue is. And to have a detailed conversation with a head teacher about any particular issues. I have, we spoke earlier about social media 
if in the bullying log I see that a number of the incidences are related to social media, you then have a conversation about how the school is actually you know, ensuring that that is dealt with. So you're looking to see that in the personal social education, there is the required focus on positive behaviours around social media. You're looking to see that it's covered in assembly. You're often looking to see that they've got a separate policy on appropriate use of social media. You're talking to staff, you're talking to children to ensure that it's been dealt with appropriately. So you're looking, with all data, you're looking for themes. You're looking for any particular issues that are emerging. Sometimes it's, it's a one-off, it's something that's been dealt with very quickly by the school, the parents have been, have been pulled in and the situation has been dealt with and therefore you don't, you, know, you don't see it in any way carrying forward. So data is important. Inspection teams look at bullying logs in schools. We will also look at the bullying policy and the anti-bullying policy. Um, you'll find that they're now called promoting, mainly called promoting positive relationships. It's, it's, it's couched very much in those terms. This is a long conversation of safeguarding. Uh, you know, it often goes on. I'm sure my colleagues who have been involved with safeguarding will tell you it's very detailed, it's very thorough. In a few schools, and there is not a high number because I've checked the figures for this, there may be a particular concern. For example, the promoting positive behaviour or the, or the bullying policies have not been updated recently. With that, we would then ensure that we make sure the authority, we take that back into Education Scotland and we ensure that the authority are informed that this is a particular concern. It's, a, it's very much an additional procedure to ensure the authority know directly that this is a concern and there'll be some follow-up to ensure that happens. So I think to answer the question, I think consistency and rigour are a very important outcome of the new procedures. Well, Willie, do you want to come back in there? Mary's got a brief supplementary. So. Here, just what the actual position is on the ground, because I haven't heard yet that why did the panel the last time think there was a, a lack of data across the board? But, uh, what, do you agree with that? Is there, is, there, is there widespread data across the board? Why would the panel say such a thing? Do you think? Of course, our, our um, the majority of Catholic schools are within a local authority. So I, I went to the um, Primary Head Teachers Association of, of Catholic Heads, and they um, were all uh, absolutely sure that local authorities are robust in their policies um, of, of anti bullying and in the fact that it should be recorded. However, um, my um, understanding from what they were saying um, around the table was that there's such significant differences on what should be recorded and how it should be recorded. Um, and even just within a group, so our, our Head Teachers Association represents the eight dioceses, which includes all 32 local authorities. And even around that table, um, people who were in neighbouring local authorities, depending, for example, on the computer system that they were using to, to record data, meant that um, there, there wasn't necessarily the same opportunity to record um, a type, if you like, of, of bullying. But also, one of the things that they raised was um, about um, who gets to define what the root of the bullying is? Is it the person being bullied? Is it the bully? Is it the, the adult who's, who's looking at the situation? And so there was um, nuance and greyness um, within that as well. And um, they were very much open to um, help and to support in um, a way to ensure that the data was accurate. Just really to, to say, um, the, the existing guidance on anti-bullying, the national approach, did contain information and uh, advice and guidance on recording. And monitoring, I would have to say, it's not just about the recording. It's, it's really important that we monitor that, that we look for any issues with, 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 within the, the, the data and address them, and address them at a local level. And I would also say that it's really, really important to involve young people in that. Um, again, it's back to that ownership at a local level so that they're involved in that, that data analysis. The new um, guidance, uh, Respect for All, which I'm conscious that you, you haven't actually seen, but if I, if I can just say that there's a much stronger emphasis on recording and monitoring with, within the, the, the new guidance. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it's guidance. 
we can insist, um, but it does provide a framework. Um, that, again, schools and authorities don't absolutely have to follow it. And again, we would like authorities to be able to place their, their own stamp on it and um, make it personal to, to, to their own local authority. But for example, um, the suggested framework does talk about um, you know, making it very clear who, who's actually involved, where the bullying's taking place, you know, if, if it is face-to-face -face or if it's, it's social media, etc. The type of bullying, bullying experienced? Um, I, is, is there an underlying prejudice or a protective characteristic there? Um, consideration of personal or additional support needs and importantly what the actions are, what the next steps are, what, what, what's, um, what's going to take place next. So we would hope by having those strong recommendations within that guidance when the guidance is, is published um, then there'll be a much more consistent approach ac across the country to recording and then my, my colleagues within HMI will be able to see that when, when, when they're out in schools. Can I ask you in the capacity of ADES um, in relation to this, because one of the things we did here in November was a very inconsistent approach to how data is gathered and recorded and how that's then used in order to identify and, and tackle bullying strategies. Um, is that something that, that you're aware of as an overview organisation uh, at director level um, and whether you've taken any action to address it? Well, we, I disagree with the respect me uh, position of taking a local re uh, recording of data around bullying. It's not just about recording though. Um, data should be uh, recorded and it should be analysed. The, anal the, analysis, the, the analysis of it is more important. It's about gaining information to measure the effectiveness and the impact of our anti-bullying approaches on our young people who are directly affected by bullying. And that, that has to remain the purpose of data collection. It's about improving the service to young folk. Um, as I say, it should be gathered, analysed and actions, it should result in actions taken to address instances of bullying and to build a young person's resilience in response to instances of bullying, ensuring that we continue in getting it right for every child. Every child. In and there should. Well, but does yeah, well, it get it done? That, I think that's the question well, that we want think, to know. Does I think it the get... a guidance that is proposed through Respect for All will help us with that and it will help consistency. And we welcome that guidance. Okay. Mary's got a brief supplementary bill, and then I'll bring you back in. What, Mary? Thank you, um, convener. I just wanted to ask a specific question of, of Mary, and it's in relation to the safeguarding um, element of the inspect inspection process. And it does relate to the points that um, my colleague Willie Coffey has been making. You said earlier that the safeguarding element has been enhanced. Can you tell me why? because the child protection guidance was updated in 2014 and includes new elements which are very very pertinent to the modern world for example for example female gen genital mutilation uh, the work around uh, the prevention of sort of terrorism it also includes elements in terms of sexual um, and, and gender issues that are constantly being updated so as these get updated Clearly, um, that schools' policies also have to reflect that, and schools have to ensure that when they're when they're discussing these issues with young people, that they are using current and up-to-date information. So it is an ongoing issue, and it reflects national guidance. It also reflect, or did it reflect, the fact that there wasn't an awful lot of data collection, and that's why that element has been enhanced. No, not from the point of view of Education Scotland, because when we're going in, we're looking at the data that individual schools have. And I, I can understand that you, know, you, you will want, possibly want to have a discussion about data beyond the school level. But for inspectors, we're looking at individual schools when we do the school inspection. And there has been an expectation for a number of years that schools are data rich. That's a very much an expression that comes from the journey to excellence, which comes from how good is our school three. Um, so it's so schools need intelligence, and schools that use intelligence well, they analyse it, they intervene, they change their approaches. That's the most important aspect of high quality data. That actually static data represents its own risk because you're collecting data. You can go into a school and a head teacher has many brightly coloured folders and everything's beautifully colour coordinated, but you're not seeing the actions or the impact of the data and, and that's a very important aspect in terms of inspection. 
Thank you. Hi, thanks, Convener. I just wanted to finish up my point on the data recording issue. I mean, and I appreciate um, what, what the panel is saying about the thoroughness of the, the kind of structure of the data that we might be looking at in the future. But the point I wanted to make was that it's still advisory, it's still guidance, it's, it doesn't seem to be a requirement to record. So I'm wondering how, whether you think we needed to take that step to go beyond advisory and guidance and expectation and so on, and to actually ask and require schools to record this kind of data. Otherwise, how would children and parents know what the position is at a particular school <coughs> if they don't collect and gather or even report this information? Yeah, um, I mean, as, as you pointed out, it is, it is guidance. Um, so the language that's used, the strongest language in terms of recommendations within, our, uh, within the policy is should. However, local authorities can, within their, because it's because part, part of, of, of um, the policy is the recommendation that local authorities develop their own policy and then schools and all other organisations, youth organisations, etc., develop their own policy as well. Um, so at a local level, um, local authorities can be much more, uh, they, they can use stronger language in terms of what they expect from their schools. May on. In terms of data recording, for us, because it's specific to each school, there is a very strong expectation from all sides that there will be a, a clear record. Um, certainly in all of our mainstream schools, parents come into the schools, sign a contract with the school in which they are a tripartite part of the education of the child. Um, they will expect to be able to be shown a very clear record of how things have been dealt with in any situation, as will the governing board of a school. Um, now, obviously, it will be up to individual teachers and, to a certain extent, the senior pastoral staff or the deputy head, whoever it is, to deal with a particular issue, whether it's immaturity and naivety to a certain respect through to more serious elements of bullying or harassment. But the, the, there's an expectation there. And what's, what has helped when you get children involved, for instance, through the Respecting Rights Agenda to produce their code of conduct themselves is there's an expectation from them that it be recorded that it's not just treated as you know, um, high spirits or whatever it might be. And there's also an ethos that it is appropriate to report and record, and therefore not something that you're seen as being a clipe or a snitch or whatever. Um, on the, for instance, on the cyberbullying issue, one of the things we stress in our training is the importance of recording information. There's an assumption that in things like Snapchat and other things, it all just disappears. There are ways of capturing quite a lot of this data if, uh, teachers and support staff are canny about it and know how to deal with it. So um, there, there, there's an absolute expectation and a governing board will expect, um, as would indeed the Care Inspector or Education Scotland, to be shown uh, on paper exactly what was done in any one individual case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Move, moving on to another substantive issue in our inquiry. I think, Mary, you're going to pick up um, specific aspects that, that you're interested in. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask about training. In a previous session, we heard about um, the degree to which teachers are, are trained to, to recognise and cope with bullying in schools while, while they're going through their teacher training. Um, we didn't get an awful lot of substantive information about exactly what form that took, the degree of importance that was placed on it, or how long um, the, the modules, whether there was one, two, three, or it, it was refreshed before the left um, teachers were actually given. So d do you think, within the element of teacher training, that the training is robust enough to properly equip teachers when they go into schools to be able to cope with and deal with all forms of bullying? John, you made a comment in your very final comments, and you said, if teachers are Whereas we want to know, are teachers yeah. canny yeah. and equipped, and yeah. how are they being equipped if they're not? Well, I mean, it's the expect, it would be the expectation of us and the schools that they would be. And, I mean, going on exactly that point, I think there are elements in teacher training that are robust enough. But it would be folly in the extreme to assume that once you've been teacher trained and you've done your papers, that's it over. And that's the point of our professional learning and development is it's career long. And that includes heads. We have heads and governors and chairs of governors in to discuss these issues, not just the, the classroom teachers and support staff. So, for instance, we've got a, uh, an event uh, next month, I think, I think Brave the Rage may be coming to it, which is specifically for pastoral staff in boarding schools to look at the latest 
developments, maybe aspects of cyberbullying, but also um, the latest you know, best practice. We've got another event, I think, the month after that on gender neutral uniform policies in schools and these sorts of things. So it, yes, I think it, the more could be done in terms of teacher training. Of course, in our sector, we tend to have teachers coming from a very background. So we have a lot of teachers coming from down south. We'll have a fair amount of teachers coming from, at least at the moment, elsewhere in the EU and further afield, um, the Commonwealth. Um, so they will have had a different uh, formation. And of course, if you're coming from far afield, your attitude to these things may be different as well. Um, just as if you've got pupils coming to a boarding school from the other side of the world, their attitude to what constitutes bullying may be different, um, which is why it's increasingly important to make sure that you have trained. So we've probably got 3,500 teaching staff in the sector. I'd say at least a third of them go through SCIS training every year of some form or another. And the, the biggest section of that is child protection and wellbeing training. So we don't see it as something that once you've got your certificates, that's all over. Would anyone else like to comment? Um, just I've, I've uh, had feedback from LGBT that they've been working with seven out of the eight um, initial teacher education providers in, in, in the last year. That's the eight, including the, the University of Highland, Highlands and Islands. Um, respect me themselves have, have been working with, with, with the universities and um, there's a, a lot of new development work going on just now. Um, LGBT are developing a new toolkit. Um, they've got a consultation day coming up very soon and they'll be planning to launch the new toolkit following the, the publication of, of Respect for All. Um, and also Scottish Government are in discussion with LGBT in Stonewall about the provision of uh, the, the provision of further training from themselves together, um, looking at further resources and training. Um, and that would be across the, the whole teaching profession, ranging from ITE right through to um, teachers in, in, in the classroom, but also senior managers as well. Um, I think given the data from, from uh, Ty and the Stonewall uh, research contained in the Education Scotland response and all the contributors from the 10th of November regarding bullying and its effect on our LBGTI and young people, um, we see it as particularly important that the release of this resource now goes ahead as Respect for All ensures that all training events and policies will include prejudice-based bullying and take recognition of the protected characteristics as well as making links to UNCRC. And uh, some of that work has gone ahead with, uh, with Respect Me and it is, the training is um, planned as of a high quality, but we need that guidance to be released now. Right, okay, I'll give you an example. So LGBT youth have spoken to us, the Thai campaign have spoken to us, Carol Guides have said some things this week about education. I was at the launch of the EIS booklet in the summer about misogyny in, in, in classrooms. All of these organisations are all saying the same thing. And the one thing they're saying is some of the teacher training in CPD is inadequate. Now, I was speaking to two professionals last week who took part in teacher uh, CPD last week about violence in the classroom, especially domestic violence in that sense. And they, they were, the whole lesson was taught completely in binary terms. It was men and women and not much more the broader characteristics of, of what's much more reflective. And it seems that all of these groups are all telling us this stuff, but it doesn't seem to be filtering through to which actually is being delivered on the front line. How do we address that? I think any training, we need to reinforce teachers' confidence in dealing with issues of prejudice-based bullying, harassment in the school system, uh, in order to, to reduce the significant impact of bullying on lifelong mental health and educational attainment. Um, we need to ensure that appropriate equalities training is in place for student and newly qualified teachers and sub uh, educational support staff. That has to be revised and updated. It's the only way we're going to get up to date and our teaching methods and our experiences with private children also are up to date. Mary. I do have a concern because we have heard from panel after panel um, from professional people who tell us that we have policies we refresh the policies, we introduce another policy, we refresh it again, we do something else. And then we get young people in here to tell us that it's made absolutely no difference. Mm -hmm. And with the greatest of respect, introducing policy after policy after policy clearly is not addressing the issue. And, uh, it's to change, it's practice policy, you can have all the policies you like, but we need to, we need to have our staff trained and be confident in their delivery uh, and, and meeting the needs that these children are showing and are, are, are demanding of us. So we need to change our approaches and that will be helped through the guidance that we're going to get. It will also be help, help and, and it will help um, develop our, 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 
our, um, our response is, if we then listen to young people, we need to listen to young people. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so, Mary sorry. and David as well. <laughs> Can I particularly then ask John, because you're from independent schools and you said that you work with um, your pupils. Can you explain to us then how you develop your policies and your strategies with the input from young people and what difference you think that makes? Yeah, I mean, I was I was speaking to one of the schools here in Edinburgh last week about exactly about them moving from uh, level one to level two rights respecting school and what that actually meant. And uh, and they had used their pupils, um, both talking about the UN Convention, but talking about all sorts of other aspects in the school, to rewrite their policies. So the children had actually sat in on the process, and therefore they were the ones who were policing those policies as well. Um, I can think of another school in the West where bullying cases quite often are, at first, depending on the severity, obviously, are looked at by the final year at school. And as a sort of collegiate approach, how can they, as older people who've been through the same school within living memory, uh, look at that issue? Um, it's fair to say that if we thought those, the training was perfect out there, we wouldn't have to develop our own. Um, but I suppose we're in the lucky position that we can create a bespoke training and involve Ty, involve Respect Me and others. Um, but I think the point that was made about... Um, uh, the prevent duty is an important one. Scotland, I think, has got the prevent duty right to a certain extent because it is not focused just on one particular faith against another and saying this is a, this is against radicalisation of one kind. It looks at sectarianism, it looks at extreme white, it looks at all sorts of other aspects. And I think that's the same with bullying. You have to look at it in every aspect. You know, it's not just, you know, in the, in a sports changing room, it's not just boys against little boys. It's not just boys against girls. It's not, you know, the, you have to look at it in all the different varieties, and that's where, in fact, the protected characteristics come in quite useful because then you can start to identify the way in which it should be done. But um, I, I I would worry that if if we weren't able to provide the training that we do for our schools, or indeed bring in other bodies from down south and even further afield, I would worry that our schools were able to keep abreast of the developments, not in terms of guidance and statute, but actually in terms of the world, of society. Because as, as I know as a parent, and as all of you all know as parents, you're always three steps behind your children in terms of what they understand. David, do you want to come in at this point then with your supplementary? Convener, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's interesting that you brought a point procedures have got to change. Um, the convener mentioned the girl guys there. I belong to one of the largest uh, youth organisations in Scotland. Our training is put in place and how we support these leaders and how we interact with all these different groups is way beyond what you're doing just now. And how we reinforce our training and add, um, give adequate support to leaders who feel that they can't cope with it. Whereas you're an organisation who has millions and millions of pounds of local authority money, and you're talking about procedures need to change. How are you going to do this? David is one of the biggest groups of scout leaders in, in, in Scotland. So. <laughs> Sorry, I should, have, I, should have, I should have put that in there Just as my well, register of interest. <laughs> um, but we have engaged with our youth, engaged with all the different groups within the Scout Association for a long, long time and promoted it. Um, it's one of these things that when you walk into any scout hall, you'll see anti-bullying posters, all the steps that we've got to take um, there. So how as local authority education or the private sector, um, we have got millions of pounds to spend and we're all volunteers doing it and supported with limited resources, but you cannot get this message across the schools. Say, yeah, no, nobody's got millions of pounds to, to, to spare. Um, but Respect Me as, as, as an organisation are, are set up to support all um, schools, establishments, organisations, um, 
uh, clubs that, that are working with, with children and young people. So they have, as part of their, their service delivery, um, an agreement to work with, with all agencies. So with bigger organisations, I mean, obviously you would need to, to speak to them in, um, about this, but with bigger organisations like, like the Scouts, then I'm sure they would look at some kind of training for trainers, cascade type model um, that, that would help them develop the, the, their own policy um, change procedures if, if, if they need to, to be changed. Um, and they would provide all of, all of that support and training. Okay. In, in our case, it, it definitely isn't millions of pounds because millions of pounds aren't there. I mean, the, the courses we run, literally, it's the cost of photocopying and the coffee. Um, unless there are outside speakers who charge, which very rarely they do, because apart from anything else, I mean, we have, speak we have speakers and attendees from uh, local authority schools, actually from down south, sometimes from Ireland and the Netherlands now. Um, and a lot of the time, all you're doing is identifying a school or a centre or a charity or others where they've done something new and innovative in a particular area and getting them to come and share that best practice. And our schools are very keen to do that. Um, so it, it needn't be a huge, costly complex thing because apart from the else the bigger the structure you set up the less flexible it is to respond to a new development i mean half the stuff that's in our child protection guidelines wasn't there when i started in this job seven years ago okay mary it's just the concept of training has also changed um particularly around something as important as preventing bullying and harassment we would certainly have an expectation that staff model positive behaviour as well. I think it's a very important aspect in terms of any culture to prevent bullying and harassment. We would expect um, senior staff and peers to regularly be going to the class of teachers to look at how they're interacting with pupils, to see how they're behaving, and very much to give them feedback in terms of improving their, um, their quality of, the, of their teaching and very much about how they're interacting with young people. So I think training as maybe a sort of two week course or a, a day course, it's about career long, it's about the coaching, increasingly coaching type approaches that are coming in. It's about helping our teachers. When a teacher comes out of college, they are just at the start of their learning. And it's very much about them being able to link with staff that are very skilled in terms of supporting young people and learning from them, having opportunities. And there's been a, an increase in uh, teachers working in trios, um, work small groups working often from different schools, about looking at each other's classes and sharing that insight with each other to strive to improve the quality of the learning and teaching. That clearly has an impact in terms of how young people, children and young people are supported in our schools and also in the playground and beyond the classroom. That also the um, in dramatic increase in third sector involvement in schools has been, to me, one of the more exciting developments in Scottish education. We go into schools now and we see boat builders and we see the police and we see NHS, we see local businesses. And also, when I go on inspection, now I'm having to take my wellies because I'm often on a farm or, you know, an outdoor centre looking uh, the work goes on so the learning the learning doesn't always happen in the classroom now but in terms of the third sector we would fully expect the child protection procedures the safeguarding the same rigor in terms of anti-bullying to be going on both with our third sector and with our schools and that's done driven very much from the school in terms of setting the procedures up so that everyone is quite clear of the expectation of the school um, young people should be supported regardless of where the learning is happening. Yeah. Come back in, Mary. Yeah. yeah, one final question. In relation to um, a policy on anti-bullying and a refresh that's done to a policy on anti-bullying, wh what is the panel's expectation of how that will be fed down through the school? If a policy is refreshed and it's taken into a school, how is every teacher trained or updated on that policy? In terms of inspection, I asked them. I mean, during a, a, an inspection of a, say, a secondary school of, of, of a thousand pupils, say, um, at the end of the week, you know, at least you know, 
Well, most of the teachers have you know, at least seen an inspector. They've had opportunities to meet with inspectors. There's drop-in sessions where people can just come in and talk to us. I'll even talk to teachers in the lunch. I don't normally take lunch, but I always join a school canteen to talk. I'll say, have you seen the latest policy? What's, what's been happening in terms of the, the school's approaches to bullying, to promoting positive behaviour? We ask, remember, um, school inspection has three elements. It's the quantitative data, it's the people's views, and it's the direct observation. We also have focus groups of teachers. We have focus groups of pupils, and we're constantly asking them around very important aspects. Uh, we also put out pre-inspection questionnaires, as you know, um, in terms of parents and teaching staff and pupils before an inspection, and we gather and collate the uh, feedback from those. And just to say that for 2015, 2016, for example, um, most, 85% um, of primary pupils and the majority of 71% of secondary pupils strongly agree or agree that staff are good at dealing with bullying. So we're also using being data rich in terms of our own data. To, uh, if we see an issue, then we'll ask why. And then we'll say, well, you know, how does staff not know? You need to do training. We also look at training logs as well to see. We always check the child protection. Everyone has to have child protection training. But we also look to see what the educational psychologist is doing, what the social workers are doing, what the third sector are doing in terms of helping staff to become better equipped, more competent at delivering the health and well-being. That's all part of the inspection process. Labour the point, but you said that you, you will ask teachers if they have seen the latest policy. By that, do you mean have they read the latest policy or have they had practical, actual training in it? I would ask them, oh, you know, what's, has the school got a new ball policy on anti-bullying? Have you seen it? Where, where do you find the anti-bullying policy? That's a question I'll, I'll ask. Now, increasingly, they have their own shared area for policy and procedures. I'll say, when was it last updated? What difference has it made? Were you part of the team helping to develop that? How, how was it taken forward? Um, the normal procedure is they have working groups to take forward different procedures. So one working group might be working on anti-bullying. Another might be working on work-based learning. There are different priorities coming from the school improvement plan. So it's a set of questions. We very quickly, because we're doing this week in, week out, we very quickly know if, when staff will say to you, is there a policy? What do you mean? So as soon as you get anything, any kind of alert like that, and clearly that becomes a very focused discussion and further follow-on actions in terms um, of the school. So it is rigorous because we're also triangulating as well. So all inspectors, and there could be six, seven, eight people out in the secondary team, and we're all feeding back the information that we're gathering to triangulate our evidence to come to conclusions. So it's, the conversation varies depending on the responses, but we'll also... Um, go to the deputy head and saying, well, we're talking to, to teachers and teachers don't know about the policy. Why is that? So it's an ongoing. Sometimes the deputy head will say, we only, well, occasionally, they'll say, well, it was only written three months ago and we haven't had our plans. Or others are saying, well, it was written three years ago and we need to update it. But it's very quickly an identified action and that gets written in and shared at the sharing of findings in terms of the inspection process. Okay, does anyone else want to comment, Maggie? Just, just in relation to the, the, poli the new policy again, there are very clear um, prior, um, areas of responsibility for teachers, parents, pupils themselves. Um, I'm conscious that that's what's written down in, in, in black and white and you're interested in, in what's actually happening in practice. Mm -hmm. For us, our expectations are really strong in terms of the development of the policy. The process is really, really important. Um, that it's not a case of the national policies taken and the, you know, the name rubbed out and the local authority or the school names put, put in and, and, and there's just a few changes throughout. The, the process um, that involves um, as many people as possible um, in the development of it is, is so important. And again, I'm going to go reiterate how important it is to have children and young people involved in that, but also parents as well. Um, so that staff within the school are involved in the development of the process. And it's the staff themselves and the children and young people that present it to their other to their peers. Um, you know, that it's not the head teacher standing up there, it's it's 
it's the, the working group and the children and young people that present it to the staff, support staff, and, and the children and young people themselves. And obviously, once it's done, once it's, it's out there, it, it's important it's not just left on a shelf. So our expectations would be around, you know, keeping, the, the, keeping it high in the agenda, having the posters around, doing the assemblies, making sure that there's, there's references to it and improvement plans, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a clear monitoring and review process built into that. Okay. Um, so that you know that that's what we would expect. I, do, what, we are going to be holding, or we're planning to hold engagement events um, following the, the the launch of the of the policy to help schools and um, clubs, etc., implement the, the policy. And these are the kind of things that, that we would be, be talking to them about again. Okay, thank you, and John. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> part of my job. Uh, is to make sure the schools know that this kind of conversation is going on. I say we weren't on the original steering group, but I brief heads at least once a term and senior staff. I quite often address individual meetings of governing boards. I was talking to 21 heads in Perth and Kinross yesterday, and I talked about this event this morning. So we will want schools to feed in at a draft stage, at a consultation phase, just like they are on the new health guidance that came out from the government just this week. Um, so that our guidelines and our, the professional learning and development we deliver to schools is future-proof to the best of our ability in terms of new legislation, whether it's the CYP Act or the latest Child, uh, Education Act or whatever, um, and so that they are adapting best practice to that, but also so that they are feeding in. Because we may be a small sector in, in, in numbers terms, but you know, I don't, I'm not an edu education expert. I have 3,500 education experts out there. So those are the views I want to come through into consultations like this. Um, so I would expect uh, certainly the senior staff and the governing boards of schools, but also the key pastoral staff, to know well about developments like this while it's in its draft form and where appropriate to, to feed into it, not to wait and see what the, the outcome of it was and then simply implement it. Okay. Okay, we need to, we need to move on. Jeremy. Um, thank you and good morning. I just want to develop slightly more just two or three issues that have already been discussed. Just at a very basic level, if I'm a, a classroom teacher in an average school in Scotland today, how much training would I get on bullying and how to deal with it in, say, a two-year... So I've been a teacher for five years. How much would I be given in regard to training on bullying? I mean, it, it very much does depend on the school and the local authority that, that, that you're working within. Um, it, it's, up, it's up to them to develop um, their the, the training programmes, their CLPL programmes for, for staff. Um, but the kind of things that they would call upon, um, I mean, again, going back to the, the preventing bullying, cre um, creating a, a positive ethos and culture, we would expect you to be involved at a local level in um, approaches to developing positive relationships and behaviour. So we've already spoken about restorative approaches, nurturing approaches, these kind of things. We would expect that you, that you were involved in, in, in those. Um, also, respect me. Schools could be engaging with respect me to, to, to provide training, um, looking on the, the you know respect me's web, but also looking on Education Scotland's web and Glow pages as well for, for, for sharing examples of, of practice there. Um, and psychological services within local authorities will be providing um, training again in a lot of these positive relationships and behaviour approaches. Um, so you would, should be able to access them. So there should be whole school training, but there should also be training. Um, offered at a local level that you can access and there's also training that you can access at a national level that Education Scotland would, would offer in, in terms of positive relationships and behaviour. Okay, it would be regular training, it would be ongoing, it would be related to the school improvement planning process. You would take that forward, you may, all staff would have access to, to um, training, you would have bespoke training where uh, staff can actually um, highlight um, issues that they have through their PRD process, and then they could they, um, they could apply for um, training through the local authority. So there are lots of different routes. There's, there'll be training in school. 
uh, working in trios, as, as you were saying, and working in groups around policy and practice in your locality. You would get advice through external trainers about national uh, practice and national national policy, and you would then you would then work together as a class, a school group to then translate that into actions for your own community. Uh, working with staff, working with pupils, which is important, vital, and also with their families. So that would be ongoing. So. From, from year to year, there will, be, there will be a consistency in the nurturing approaches, the, the restorative approaches, and all of that embeds um, and develops the culture that will then support anti-bullying um, strategies and making them most effective within our schools. So it's an ongoing process and a regular feature. I mean, I just, I just, I mean, just to be absolutely frank, I have, I've spoken to quite a number of teachers over the last couple of months, and that is simply not their experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest concern I have, and I suspect other members of this committee have, is that we are so caught up in policies and strategies and high browed thinking that the average class teacher who's trying to do a really good job is simply not getting the training and help to do what we're saying. And I think I find it still concerning that we talk so much about policies and strategies, which are important and have a place, but if they're not being embedded in our local school, and in a local classroom, then we just simply sit on a shelf. I, I suppose the second issue was picking up Barbara's point, um, and maybe this is aimed again at Philip, is that the way that information is recorded seems to vary quite dramatically between different local authorities. So one local authority would deem that is a bullying incident, one may not. How it's dealt with which seems to vary. Again, is there no guidance given across Scotland where we are having the same recording happening, not in each local authority, but in each school. So we're comparing apples with apples. Because I think the danger is that some schools may be recording it very well, but then being criticised for having too much bullying in the schools, while other schools don't record it and are not picking up on the issues. So it seems strange to me that we don't have a, a standard way of recording bullying incidents. back to, to, to what I said earlier, I, I mean, if, if a child feels bullied, um, then it should be recorded as a bullying incident. Um, there, there's, no, there's no threshold, if you like, for, for, for what bullying is. If, if a child feels bullied, then it, they're being bullied, and that, that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be recorded. So that, there should be consistency a, a, around so, that. So, so why are we ending up, as Barbara says, with different local authorities doing it in different ways? because it's up to the individual local authority to develop their, their, their own policy and recording systems to do that. Do you think that's the key issue here? It's inconsistency. I, I, I think, it's, I think the, the recording and the monitoring is absolutely crucial. Um, it, as long as a system, a process is set up that people understand and they adhere to and apply consistent, consistently at a local level, and then the tracking and monitoring is done at a local level so that any gaps, any issues, any recurring themes are addressed at a local level, that's what's important. So it's getting it right within the individual school, local authority, and applying it consistently at that level. Jeremy's obviously picked up on points that you made. Barbara, would you like to come back on, yeah. on those points? Yeah, and, and I think that there's, you know, some things are kind of um, converging now in terms of training, in terms of consistency. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that um, the intention of every uh, teacher training um, institute, every local authority, is to do the best for the children who they've got within their care. Um, but sometimes it's these... Um, uh, almost like the, the policies are becoming barriers to, to being able to do that. My experience as a classroom teacher was that every single year I had a consistent input on child protection. Um, at the beginning of every academic year, that was that was standard. And that led into an, a holistic view of the protection of every child, including anti-bullying. And it's my understanding that that's what should happen in, in every school um, across the country. It should start with a view of child protection. Um, but I think it's there's different in terms of what the induction year training is, depending on the local authority that you're in um, and how much um, is, is offered there for NQT teachers. Um, my responsibility as a, an individual uh, teacher for my own professional update, then um, I have to look at the standards in which I have to apply within um, my career and I have to ensure that I keep myself um, refreshed. And so I, I, I think that while consistency is an issue, there's also perhaps a... Um, 
a blurring of where it becomes solely about anti-bullying and where it becomes the getting it right for every child agenda. Um, because I think that schools are trying to do that, but maybe teachers don't name it as an anti-bullying training session or an anti-bullying policy or, you know. Um, so I, uh, I do agree that there are the inconsistencies that are perhaps stopping the data. I do think that people are trying to do the, the, the best, but I do think it can be improved. Okay, just, just one final question, again, in regard to training, in that all bullying is wrong, I think there's no disagreement in regard to that, but bullying for different spectres of whether you're a disabled or whether it's race or whether it's sexuality or whatever will be different. How does your training reflect that? Clearly, Ty have worked in a campaign in one, one area. Um, what about disability? What about race? Um, is there training out there specifically on how you deal with someone who's been bullied, who is disabled, or who is being abused on a racial issue? Um, I, I can't, can't speak for, for everyone's experience of how they would do that formally in a local authority, but my experience as a classroom teacher was that it was um, very localised. So, for example, when um, we were aware at transition, for example, of um, some young people who were attending our school who had um, particular disabilities or um, who were um, immigrants or um, had a language barrier, um, then that would be raised, at, um, first of all, within um, a, um, a safe environment for staff to hear about it, with some partner agencies coming in to talk to us about what would be the appropriate things to look out for and how to look after that young person um, but I would say that 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 would be very localized as well depending on the the context of your school Maggie Sorry, Philip. Well, we will, um, can, can talk uh, with Manoa on if that's okay um, there are many ways that uh, we're building capacity of staff um, in supporting anti-bullying um, a, a recent uh, we're looking at training at kind of different levels we're looking at staff training we're looking at parent training and we're looking at policy refresh yet we've talked about policy yet but essentially what if we're going to change the change the uh, um the approaches if we're going to strengthen and give teachers the more confidence in dealing with bullying then we have to our training will include what is bullying it'll talk about it will explore prejudice based bullying it'll explore online bullying um it'll look out look at uh, impacts and outcomes of the, the strategies that we're adv advocating for staff. It will look at uh, culture and policy within the school and what the, the prerequisite is for um, an inclusive and a, a nurturing approach uh, within a school. Um, it, will look at, it, will, it will explore the child who's, bu uh, who's bullying and it will explore resilience that we can help build in our young people. These are plans and these are uh, training um, programmes that are about to be launched in North Ayrshire. Um, and we'll look at case studies and what we can learn from case studies and we'll, we'll discuss that it's a little bit regular. So that, that training really is then focusing on particular aspects and, and, and it will, it will, it will, the case studies will be used to explore um, how bullying is used in, in all its abhorrent forms, quite frankly, and how we can then respond uh, in, 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 in supporting young people. So we are looking at all of that. Did you want to come in? Really, really, I mean, Philip's kind of said it all, but really, I, I, the only thing I want to add to that is that I think it's very important that we don't create a hierarchy of bullying, that, you know, one bullying is, 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 is more horrendous than another because all bullying is horrendous and shouldn't happen and needs to be addressed. So I think we need to be very careful. But yes, I agree, it's uh, within the training programmes, it's helpful to have some additional knowledge um, in relation to perhaps some of the, the, the protected characteristics to help the, the training. But in terms of addressing the bullying, it's done in the same way and there's no hierarchy but there is inconsistency because one of the things that we heard from a lot of the young people we spoke about is how PSE is used in schools and obviously a very clear foundation tenet of curriculum for excellence is health and well-being and if you don't get that bit right then you don't close the attainment gap and, and kids don't perform to the best of their abilities with the right support so one of the things we heard was about how PSE was used and I have to say I've talked to, talked to a lot of young people over the past few months who have told me some horrendous stories about how PSE is, is used and especially um, going down a very moralistic route as well where a lot of young people felt really backed into a corner where they felt you know the, their thoughts and feelings were not being respected so although you're saying there shouldn't be a hierarchy which I absolutely agree with there is an inconsistency about how people in different protected characters 
literacy groups are dealt with by teachers. And that comes back to that issue about being canny and being equipped. Because what I'm hearing is teachers are not equipped, and especially on some of the issues that, um, in the manifesto for LGBT youth, for instance, or the issues that the Thai campaign have raised, or the girl guides, or even the misogyny stuff. What we're hearing is teacher are not, teachers are not equipped to, to, to deal with, with some of those issues, because either it's, it's dealt with as a moralistic issue, because it's, it's something that maybe they, they, they don't believe in. But I think what we're looking for is if, it's, if there's a belief issue there, what we want is teachers to be able to handle that. And if they can't, for whatever reason, they're equipped to signpost those kids to the right places. So in order for those kids to, to, to get that, that support. And there seems to be a, a non-recognition of LGBTI issues across schools, I have to say. Some schools are doing brilliant work. Uh, and, and that's not just, you know, that is uh, both faith schools and, and non-faith schools doing absolutely brilliant work. Some are just not. And we're hearing of young people who go down the route of self-harm, attempt, and in some cases, actually commit suicide. Now, that's where that comes down to the crux of this, is about that health and well-being of kids. And what are we doing to ensure that that journey through school is safe and supported and nurtured? And in that respect, we are not, we're not doing it at all. Um, there doesn't seem to be a recognition at all that, that there's an issue around about LGBTI uh, young people and how they should be supported through school. And that's a real concern for, for all of us. And I, and I, I don't know, I mean, I, as, as I say, it's across, across the board where there's great practice. St. Joseph's in Dumfries, Vela Leaven Academy, you know, we're hearing brilliant stuff going, going on. But in other cases, we're hearing some very, very disturbing stuff going on and how PSE is being used for that. And I know the Education Committee are going to look at PSE uh, and how it's used. My son's just left school and I had a very long, frank conversation with him about what PSE meant for him. And I have to say, it meant very little, um, which was quite, quite a concern as well. And he's able to come and speak to me about anything. But when, when I spoke to some other young people in some of the high schools in my area, PSE was a disaster because either it was a moralistic judgment on the young people or it was a waste of time. And that's how they view it. And that's the crux of this issue. We are not, we're not facing that, I don't think. Um, so your, your thoughts, I know that was a bit of a rant, but your thoughts, please. John. If I may jump in, the, um, I think that there's two aspects to that. One is, um, is as I talked about before, that, that sensibility to, to the different severity of an issue and when we do child protection training, for instance, one of our trainers has a series of scenarios that she puts in front of new teachers, probationers, gap year students, whoever, and say, what do you think this is? Quiet word in the air, letter to the parents, immediate child protection issue. And invariably, if it's this, their first time in this situation, they're erring on the side of extreme caution or on extreme yeah. liberalism. Um, and you just got to attune them to that. But the other aspect, particularly in, in terms of the, uh, protected characteristics, is attuning schools and pupils and teachers when there may be circumstances they haven't come across before. I remember speaking to a few Sikh temples a couple of years ago because a school wasn't sure how they dealt with the symbols uh, that a, a Sikh boy was carrying as to how he played team sport as a result of that. But there's plenty of guidance out there. Once you speak to it, the school could incorporate that. He spoke to his class about his faith and it was spread out from there. I mean, the respecting rights agenda is very good on that because pupils are very aware of what their rights are. And I think a lot of it is, is a tuning. When I mentioned the gender neutral policy event we're doing soon. Brighton College down in the South Coast um, took a very clear view on this uh, a few years ago. And they said, we were not having, you know, the way we're simply gonna do this, have two uniforms. One's a trousers uniform, one's a skirt uniform. You choose which one you're gonna wear. And, he's, and he said, it wasn't about uniforms that was the issue. What we were aware of was that people who had an issue in terms of uh, gender identity or transitioning were, as you said, um, at least 50% more likely to attempt self-harm mm. and in a very high percentage likely to attempt suicide. Mm. And so they were saying, we will fail as a school if we don't recognize those issues are there and find a way of speaking to those children about them. And if uniform is the route in, then that's the one we'll take. So, but it, it's, it may well be if you've been in the teaching profession for 30 years, this is the first time you've ever experienced that, um, which is why you bring people in and you train them on that basis. But a lot of it actually, at least in my experience, is pupils from different ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, uh, and with other protected characteristics as well, talking to their 
classmates into their school, into their assemblies, and saying, this is who I am. This is what I, as a Muslim, will be doing over Christmas. This kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've seen quite a lot of that. And, and once pupils start to respect the individuality of, of their peers, then there's, there's a much greater resistance within them as a group to single that person out. Barbara, would, would, would you come in there? Because uh, the, the young people that we spoke to did raise some issues about um, Catholic schools. And, and you know this because you've, see, you've, you've seen the evidence. Um, and we would like to sort of, you know, uh, get some insight into that, whether there's a recognition of some of these issues, especially around about LGBTI uh, young people, and, and, and what maybe the Catholic Education Service are, are doing to, to address that without making young people feel as if you know, sure. they're, they're committing a sin. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I think that um, part of it is teacher confidence, um, um, not only within uh, Catholic schools, but within all schools, about their confidence to be able to speak about issues that they perhaps haven't had to um, encounter before. Um, and um, we are working with our two head teachers associations to first of all find out what the reality is of the young people within um, our schools, um, and then to, to have um, what we're kind of looking at is a, a kind of a two-pronged approach to, to being able to um, help those young people. Um, the first one is to look at dedicated training for teachers, um, which will um, be within, the, as I mentioned earlier, that holistic approach of relationships and moral education, mm -hmm. but particularly looking at um, identifying um, within our secondary schools um, what we would call, I suppose, a trusted adult, someone who would be particularly trained that um, our young people um, who were perhaps um, going through issues that they didn't feel they could talk to anybody else about would, would have an identified person who they could go to. Um, and that's that's for a couple of reasons. One is so is that, that we know that that person um, is confident, is well trained and is able to support the young person and their family, but also because we don't want a culture of, within schools, teachers, um, feeling that they have to become um, counsellors for, for all of the children who, who are within, especially if, they, if they're not equipped to do that, because sometimes that can be um, more damaging than um, oh, actually cool. having the correct person to go to. Um, second to that, um, as well as the training for our staff, we're looking at inputs that we can put into relationships and moral education programmes. So, for example, We've already identified um, a resource which was used by the, um, developed by the Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales that looks at hate crimes and in particular um, LGBTI and homophobic hate crimes because we feel that, um, it, exactly as you're saying, um, that there are some, that, um, well, for us, there's, there's no, um, no way that we remove God from, from our, our approach to education but there is an, a, a time where we want to look at this in terms of um, our societal responsibility. Um, and so, for example, that would be an insert for PSE um, as opposed to religious education. Um, and so while there's a connection there and while the good of our children in terms of their spiritual, academic, physical health and well-being is all connected, we feel that that's something proactive that we, we can do immediately. Further to that, um, I have just returned from a, a conversation uh, with the Bishops' Conference um, of Scotland and um, the other things that we are hoping to do are to look at um, ways of actually getting research in this area to find out the experience of our young people, but also to find a way to support anyone who um, presents himself within school and, and says um, either um, I am transgender, I am gay, I'm, to, to be able to offer... Um, a, a, a line of support there that's out with the school. Parents, um, it's one of the hallmarks of Scotland that you know it's, it's great that parents have choice of which school to send their children to. And when they choose a Catholic school, they choose a school that um, has tradition practices and is rooted in, in the faith of the church. And we know that, and every parent, when they make that choice, knows that. So we're, we want to have a balance of ensuring that um, we are meeting the needs of those young people without any conflict with church teaching. Um, and I, I, th I think it's important to stress the fact that um, the, the term hierarchy of, of bullying uh, was used there. Um, in terms of our, our church teaching as well, there's, there's um, a consistency in church teaching, um, for example, with what we would say to our young people about sex before marriage. 
you know, um, and what we would say about um, sex um, between a man and a man and a woman and a woman, um, that uh, the, there, there's not a, a separation there in terms of homosexuality and heterosexuality. Um, so I think that there's it's, it's important for us to help our teachers to understand and for the wider side to understand what the church actually teaches as well. And we're hoping that these strategies, which are already beginning to come into place, are something which is, is going to address the needs of um, their young people, but also help to answer those questions. Yeah, that, that's really welcome uh, to, to, to hear that and, and the work that you're doing on, on, on hate crime. Um, but you mentioned about speaking to the Bishop's Conference and some of the work that's ongoing on that and, and some of the people you would, you'd speak to. You didn't mention any of those young people's representative organisations. Is, is that clear that, that they would be involved? Well, we've had meeting with Ty already. We, um, in fact, we've um, had a meeting with um, some of our young people who have gone through Catholic schools who are within the LGBTI community. Um, we're very conscious of the fact that um, this is... Um, uh, this is part of our community as well, you know. It's, it's this is um, it's not lots of separate things within Scottish society, you know. It's our it's our parents, it's our pupils, it's our local community. So, so absolutely, this yeah. is not something which is um, which this is not something which is going to be uh, solely within uh, the the Catholic Church, if you like. Although we will be um, working with, with partners and things, we will okay. be keeping an eye okay. to being authentic to church teaching. Yeah, that, 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 that is uh, extremely welcome because I don't, I don't think the issue is about... We all understand that Catholic schools teach within the, uh, uh, that faith. We, we understand that and we, we get that very clearly. The issue for us is when uh, aspects of whatever's happening in school fails and that's when discrimination comes into place. Sure. So it's about de dealing with the discrimination and not... The, 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 the moral code maybe that you would have in your faith, but dealing with the actual discrimination. And, and that's where we're we are, we are getting most of the, the, the pressure uh, coming to the committee because we're getting examples of really seriously, um, you know, terrible situations for, for some young people. But if, if you're giving me your, your, your commitment and your reassurance here that that, that is an ongoing uh, issue, we, we'll, we'll take that on board. And, um, certainly across the board we'll be monitoring <laughs> all of it as you can imagine we want this to work uh, for your sake but mainly for, for the kids sake as well Alex you wanted to just, just very entry. briefly on that point convener and um, thank you for your answer Barbara um, absolutely endorse what you say about the the uh, role of faith and consistency with church teaching in Catholic education I'm not in any way trying to denigrate that however there is for me an inconsistency there in the sense that um, as recently as the last five or ten years, particularly um, with some of the remarks from Cardinal O'Brien, um, some of the remarks of even Pope, uh, Pope Benedict, um, there, were, there was a difficulty there, a disconnect between um, the upholding of sexuality and people's choices within sexuality and the teachings of the church. Uh, that's improved a bit under Pope Francis, but we're not entirely there yet. And I just wonder if you could just tease out a little bit more about how you bridge that inconsistency between the teachings of the church around homosexuality and upholding and valuing your LGBTI pupils in Catholic schools. Okay, so I, um, I, within Catholic schools, we propose the gospel, we don't impose the gospel. And um, I think that that's the most succinct way that I can, I can share this, is that um, it, in, in all areas of, of morality, um, we can offer a vision for, um, for life. And then it's up to each individual um, of whether or not they want to um, accept that, they want to take that on board. What we want to ensure is that um, as we propose a gospel which is rooted in ensuring that the dignity of every human person is um, cherished, simply for who they are, um, and that's not compromised in any way, depending on their choices, um, that um, our, our staff and our community um, understand that there's um, no judgment to be made of people. Okay. Um, and I think that that's, um, for some, um, it's a generational thing. For some, it's um, a societal thing. For some, it's also a, a sense that um, as a protected characteristic ourselves, we feel that often it's um, our beliefs and, and our position that is, is often being attacked and that um, we, we don't have the right to defend what, what we 
see as a, as a vision for, for, for life. Um, but I would, I would and, and I think it's um, shown by the numbers of families who are non-Catholic who choose to send their children to Catholic schools, that there's something in that vision and ethos that, that they want. Um, and that, as I say, it's, 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 it's proposed. And if, if people decide that that's, that's not the choice for them at this moment or not the choice for them at any moment, um, that's, that's up to okay. them. Well, well that, that's encouraging. But um, can I also ask then how you equip and support your teachers to deal, um, to be uh, receptive and helpful to children who might look up to them and might find they're the closest adult relationship they feel comfortable in exploring their sexuality with and saying, I think I might be gay, I want to come out. Um, because I know from personal experience, my wife teaching in the Catholic education system, that there is still a bit of anxiety and a bit of doubt as to what their role should be and what they should be allowed to say to that. And actually there's a default to, well, don't talk to me about this. Yeah. Um, can you can you kind of shed some light on that and where the current sort of discussion is within sure. uh, the Catholic teaching education system, but also the bishops' conference around this? Sure, um, I I think that it's um, I think that it's fair to say that um, staff, particularly if they're not, um, if, particularly in secondary school, our primary school teach, uh, head teachers have have said to me that um, they're the they haven't seen um, a marked difference in the number of young people who have presented to them um, in any way of, of um, looking uh, or considering their sexuality or that they are, are maybe transgender. Um, they say that at the, the moment in primary school, that's not something which they would see has, um, has, has risen. For the majority, it would be within our secondary schools. For some of our secondary school teachers, it doesn't matter what the issue would be from our young people. Um, if, if they are not equipped, they, they're perhaps not a PSE teacher, an RE teacher, um, they don't feel equipped to have conversations of that ilk with, with, young, with the, the children um, anyway. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to ensure that, first of all, our staff know, um, at a very basic level, the law. Um, and, and uh, what they are allowed to talk about. But secondly, what the church actually teaches, because sometimes there's <coughs> a, a confusion there, so that they have the, the confidence and the, um, the sense of freedom to be able to talk about that. But also to sometimes say, um, I'm, I'm not the person that, I, am, that I, I think can help you. And so that's why we were going down this avenue of ensuring that within all of our Catholic secondary schools, that they would be able to um, go to someone, a trusted adult, a safe space within the school, um, where there would be someone who would have had that opportunity to be um, trained, um, for, for want of a better word, trained, um, in order to be able to, to meet the needs of, of the young people in their care. OK, I think we've well ran over our time this morning. As you can imagine, we've got a lot of areas that we want to explore uh, in this, and, and, and we will decide uh, to, after today how we're going to take forward um, some of the aspects that, that have, have um, arisen from today's evidence and, and, and the previous evidence we've got. Can we thank you so much for your, your attendance at committee this morning? You, you, ha you have given us some uh, food for thought. Um, and, and we will take take that forward but we really appreciate you coming along and if you go away and you think we should have said this or I should have said that please keep keep in touch uh, with with the committee we want to give the best advice to government in order for them to get this policy right and if the policy is right with good pragmatic pragmatic um, uh, recommendations in it, then we get it right for every single child, irrespective of what school they go to uh, and, and what area. So we appreciate your, your uh, help in doing that this morning and no doubt we will talk again. So thank you so much. I'm going to move committee into private now. Um, so I'll suspend for in order for us to move into private um, to deal with the other issues on the agenda. Thank you.